Disillusionment and opportunism reign on a troubled cylinder as great powers suddenly come under threat. This is episode 14 of the Civ Battle Royale X, season 4. It's never fun to fight alone. Hello everyone and welcome. I am Hypnosai, longtime lurker of the sub since Mark II, seizing my chance to try and narrate. With this, let's get to it. We collectively despair at Ohio's continued existence with ECH. And we also get this lovely new OC for Rio Grande from SonicFan0511, although lovely is not the word I would use for Rio Grande currently. Thanks to everyone who supported the CBRX on Ko-Fi. It wouldn't be the same without you. We get a look at the PR's opinions on Burgundy, who suffered the biggest rank loss this week, given their three-front war. Will they survive this episode unscathed? We'll just have to wait and see. We open on a view of the Cape. Last time, Eswatini was able to retrieve Malkerns, but now Ndongo's naval invasion attempt has put a serious dent in Nlagano's walls. Labotsibeni's archers might be able to fend off part of the attacking force, though, and it will take more than that fleet of bowmen to finish off the siege. Singapore continues on its newly found belligerent rampage by taking Walyalup from the Noongar, right under Wagi's nose. With this, Noongar's influence outside Australia is probably done with. Maguindanao is in bad shape, but if you take a closer look at Lamitan, the Wagi attack seems to have fizzled out. As it declares war on Pueblo, we get to see Tehulche's core. It's unimpressive. However, if you look on the right side, you'll see something marginally more exciting. New Holland launches a new assault on the Rio Grande's exiles. It's a nice fleet, for sure. I wonder what happened to the last one they sent this way. Taino and Seneca make peace, and it feels like we were robbed of a Taino invasion of the East Coast. But it seems like we won't get any action on this side of the Americas. Near the occupied city of Ganondawa, in a ravaged carry, a single Shawnee spearman weeps for its people. It will now have to do its last stand. On the west coast, Thule declares war on Pueblo. Both of them are toe-to-toe -to -toe in info attic scores, as well as in military power. Their fleets seem pretty equal, and the Yellow Knives blocks the way to any massive attack. In the end, this rivalry will be decided by whoever can gobble up that buffer state faster, but Yellow Knives is no pushover either. Recruit Ishtar sends his messages through elaborate codes, but the message is clear. The Selkups are considering an attack on the Kazakhs. Vonya's ultimate decision will depend on the state of Nur Sultan's armies, and the least we can say is that the Kazakh corps looks barren. Could these horses on the border with Astana be put to good use soon? Pharaohs, the reigning leader, continues building wonder after wonder. This time it's the Grand Canal, a new wonder that will give extra gold for every trade route. That might help for the long run, but Trondur really needs to shift away from soft power and start using their strength for something. Ishtar, having been discovered, begins his new mission at Daji's court in Zhaoge. If anyone can maneuver the intrigue and cruelty of the Fox Queen and give us an insight into her mind, it might be her. Ludwig makes big moves as Bone falls, and no Burgundian troops seem poised to retake it in the next turns. However, I wouldn't expect Bavaria to do much more for now. That army still has to maneuver past the Rhine, and Charles could reinforce Dijon from his core. Same for the Italian Alps. The German spearmen could open the path to Nancy, but they wouldn't do much. Still, progress is progress, and every small victory should be celebrated. 
Last time we had seen Sierra Leone, they were trying to defend the newly conquered Tangiers from an Alawite counteroffensive. Eight turns later, the situation has completely flipped as Peter's sizable army starts its march to retake Kanema. Kalmyk catastrophe ensues as Kazakhstan takes Elista from Bukhara. It's not like Ayuka's situation would have been better if he had actually retaken it, but this is just sad. Astrakhan is now ripe for the taking by both Kazan and the Kazakhs. The Arctic front line of the Shang Selkup Golgorio War develops as Golgorio mounts a small assault on Zhengzhou. With this, the Selkup Golgorio part of the war should come to an end. Given the state these units are in, Zhengzhou will probably not be taken soon, and I honestly don't know whether it's worth fighting for. Elista development. The city falls to a quick Afsharid attack. It will flip a few times again, but probably never in Kalmyk's favor. The Jayanagar declares war on the Karmatians, probably to join the coalition war Saba and Bogadishu declared last time. You might think that the Karmatian fleet around Safwan could threaten Belgaum or Ginji, but I think Mogadishu's presence will render that difficult, or pointless, given that they could then take the cities for their own. Pueblo finishes settling Hawaii, and the Wagi expand northward in Micronesia. There's still some free land here and there, but soon even the Pacific will be crowded. Up in the Russian Arctic, the Latvian cavalry finally makes landfall in Kazakh land. Now they just have to hope something falls. Balardong falls dangerously in the red as Palawa forces start breaking the walls. Jules Dumont d'Orville, who in his life explored the coasts of Oceania, has joined with the Tasmanians. Pelotas takes a handful of damage, but Moritz's force is wounded, divided, and depleted. If I was optimistic, that lone pikeman on the Falklands could kill the archer peeking under the trireme icon, and with reinforcements coming, New Holland could finish off Rio Grande and get their big prize. Uh, penguins? Ice? The Seneca reform their religion to completion. In other news, that lone Shawnee spearman will not live to see another day. That new Reformation belief is houses of worship. This is the third Gai Huio belief that adds a new worship building, and this one does not seem especially strong. Lamitan suffers heavy damage as the Wagi Zheng invasion restarts at full force. With a little bit of luck, that Zheng Karak should be able to take it. Simue could also be in danger really soon. In the sidebar, Visigoths and Selkups pile on the Karmatians. They assure the other members of the coalition that they could damage them at a distance through the power of petty insults. The Afsharids have gotten Megar's health to around 20%, but I'm not sure they have enough steam to take it and hold it. However, look at Dolavira. The city is surrounded, there's a catapult nearby, and Harappan units hover around the Viji front line. This could go very well for Nader Shah. Balardong falls and goes up in flame. Those Nungar horses will not do much against it, but I don't think the Palawa advance has any steam left. On the other hand, the Nungar could try something about Minge in the north of Australia. There's only a handful of archers defending the city. As a bunch of uninteresting wars get declared, we get an interesting look at Bora Bora's home islands with their new city of Tiva. The population of the three main cities is impressive, and the fleet they have amassed is too. But they don't exactly have a technological edge. If they don't attack Wagi, Teholche, or Tiwanaku, they might end up stagnating themselves into irrelevancy. Eusebius of Nicomedia, a defender of the Arian heresy back in the 4th century, hangs around in Nundawau, 
With the Seneca religion complete, no work is left for him, and he now longs for Prophetstown, a place he calls home. A pharaoh army waits outside Kayotsoke, hoping that if they stare long enough at the walls, the city will surrender. We go back to the Burgundian situation, and, as expected, Ludwig's force has failed to get past the Rhine. However, that might just be the only good news for Charles, as the English fleet harasses Amiens and the Visigoths' offensive continues. Will the dwindling pressure from Bavaria help Burgundy stabilize both of the other fronts? The only probable development in the Tuli Pueblo War, the far off city of Peuelta, is starting to take damage from Tuli's Arctic fleet. With no way to reinforce it, it seems doomed to fall. We move to the main battlefields of the shang Goguryeo War, and sadly, not much has changed. Zhodong is damaged, but will live to see another day, and Yanshi is not yet under any danger. I don't think that kind of stalemate helps Shang in any way. Goguryeo has weaker neighbors to prey on, and easier terrain to fight them. In the end, it's hard not to see them taking the upper hand. Tiwanaku is still doing well, but just as Emerald Range noticed last episode, their army isn't really impressive. However, we can see that most of their workforce is now situated in the north, next to Ecuador. Is the Proletarian Liberation Army hoping to do something? This might be Mogadishu's single greatest moment. Zahran, a city that has existed for 40 turns without ever taking a single pop, has turned to red. Everything is now possible. Rome and Kanem Bornu are now dangerously close from both Cairo and Damanhur. Their chances are not that good. The Mamluks still have a handful of archers to thin down the attackers, though not much more. And for some Elista development, at the top of the screen you can see Elista flipping between Kazakhstan and the Afsharids. Out of nowhere, an Alawite counteroffensive retakes Tangiers. However, as Kanema starts taking damage, the outcome of the war is clearer and clearer, and the Alawites would need another surprise to fend it off. After an unseen flip, Ballardong falls again to the Palawa. Neither side has enough strength left on this front to stop this, although a single horseman and a couple of Nungar missionaries will try their best. Compared to the Timonaku core seen a few slides ago, Pueblos is actually impressive, full of their unique bowmen, the Lada Kwe. What's more, under the hem of Muhammad Yunus, the Bengali great merchant, Pueblo is considering making the move to microcredit. Come to think of it, their treasury's not particularly full. Their neighbor, the Osage, rests after finishing off that last Shawnee resistance. Their army looks a bit thin to the west, on the border with Pueblo, but they are starting to build a lot of their UU, the Old Don Guard, the unique pikeman that begins with experience equal to unused strategics, and gains extra terrain outside friendly territory when upgrading. It's hard to know right now how much that first bonus might affect them, but the second one will only be useful if Osage finds a new target to attack, and except for Florida, they are running out of weaker neighbors. As predicted, Lamitan falls to Zheng, who put it to the flame, and Simue starts taking damage. With two of Maguindanao's archers surrounding it, I don't see how their melee units will be able to liberate the city, but if they did, Wagi would be the first to benefit. From Ishtar, we learn that Daji, the fox dictator, is planning to attack Vijayanagara, a decision that would only make sense in a twisted mind, surely. As for Virginagara, they are looking as boxed in as ever, and that attempt to invade Arabia is not going well. On this slide, we get a look at the different governments of the world. First off, the dictatorships, with Nestor Machno trying to justify that his newly formed military dictatorship is just one stage of anarchist liberation. To note, Pahuska is not a dictator, but a polemarch. 
the monarchies are more varied, with Taino, ever the quirky one, being an elective monarchy. The commons have power in both Sierra Leone and the Alawites, whereas Ismail bin Sharif is not just a king, but a god king. More monarchies, with the nobility being the dominant estate in a majority of them. Abu Bakr of Mogadishu has joined Taino on the elective monarchy's side. He is called the diplomat, maybe because of the joint war he's leading against Karm, or maybe because he's not been doing much that's worthy of a better title. We move on to hordes. Not much to say there, except that two of the three major South American powers are hordes. Principalities and republics follow, where we learn Tecumseh is now in exile, and Krishna Devaraya has declared himself leader of the people. Where would he even lead them? Apparently, Rikyo Maya of the Umesami is a demarch, and I honestly have not found what that is. Next are theocracies with Maguindanao, Pueblo, Iko Iki, and Palawa. Finally, only four tribes remain Rio Grande, Joschutz, Rosvi, and, interestingly, Eswatini, which are clearly suffering from their horrible tech score. Now is the time for world religions. The main change from last time is that now, Iko Iki's religion has spread all over Gogorio and Nivch, and Kalmyk's faith expanded a bit to the east. Sadly, Shawnee's religion is gone, replaced by Pueblos. More maps? More maps. We now take a good look at the entire world, which is starting to fill up. In terms of diplomacy, the whole world is at war, save for Mongolia, Kazan, Bora Bora, Taino, and the elusive Crow. Most countries are happy, and a few, notably Pharaohs, Latvia, Bavaria, and Yellow Knives, are in a golden age. Florida too, but that might be one of McGregor's scams. Zheng, we learn, is very unhappy. The growth map tells us something radically new. Struggling countries mired in war, such as Burgundy, Alawites, and the Mamluks, have declining populations. Fascinating. On another note, Tiwanaku's growth is stagnant. I don't know how much that will affect them in the long run, but that is something to keep in mind. Also, Taino is booming. We go back to regular gameplay as Ishtar is sent to the Osage capital of Ni Oshode. Osage is at an interesting point, and it'll be nice to get more info about their future plans. Bill Gates joins the Mamluks as a great merchant, and hopes to help them fend off the invasion. Unless he can build a computer out of sand and wheat, I'm not sure there's actually anything he can do. Frederick William Beachy joins the Dutch attack on Pelotas. In accordance with his name, he complains that the fleet is just slogging around the coast, seemingly setting their sights toward Bajé. We learn Elizabeth has declared war on Kirmukarmu. This is only interesting if it's going to be part of a more relevant joint war. Otherwise, it's just an excuse for us to look at Royal Hungary's corps. Like all the civs in Europe, it suffers from its lack of cities, and their stats show it. Now that the Pontus and Latvia wars have ended, it's hard to see what they could do next. Jeanne d'Arc appears in Sierra Leone, confused as to what invader she has to fight against when her country is currently doing the invading. Which is going very well, incidentally. Kanema seems ready to fall in the coming turn, and even Rabat could be threatened if Peters keeps the momentum. Hiroshi Yamauchi, who led Nintendo's turn to video games, arrives in Wagi. He presents an interactive game with two patriotic heroes, Wario and Waluigi, to boost the morale of Minge while they wait for a Noongar assault. 
On Noongar's side, a militarily more relevant historical figure appears in the person of Gaius Dullius, a Roman general who developed boarding tactics during naval battles against the Carthaginians. Noongar can hope he is enough to break the Palawa fleet looking to advance to Pinjara. The booming Taino elective monarchy appears in all its glory. Frankly, Taino has nothing to be shy about, but their situation is not too bright. Maybe it's time to tickle Florida again. Tiwanaku builds the Great Mosque of Damascus, which gives access to a unique caliphate government as well as some more sovereignty. Hopefully it helps them in any way. Around a million people live in the city of Tiwanaku, which is fine, but underwhelming compared to their immediate rivals. At least life with the Cerro de Potosi in view must be nice. It happened. The cape is in Ndongo's hands now. Not much to expect here other than one or two flips. This is pretty damning for Eswatini, who in my mind are plummeting to the bottom of the cylinder. Their only options now are either to destroy Rosvi or prey on Mogadishu's weaknesses, but their tech is so weak, I don't see that going well for them. In massive news, Mergar falls to the Afsharid naval invasion. That carrot to the south won't let that stay for long, but it's a heavy blow for Harappa. In brighter news for them, no significant push has been made on Tolavira. Is Afsharid fumbling through success? Emulated by the invention of Nintendo Interactive Games, Leonardo da Vinci joins Wagi. And on the other side of the world, Guru Arjan of Pueblo, OTL, a Sikh leader, arrives in his hometown of Prophetstown to spread his religion through Osage land. Seneca needs to sweep in if they want to get the Blue Conquerors on their side. And on another other side of the world, Philip II of Macedon, father to Alexander, oversees the Mamluk defense of Damanur. Things go poorly as he tries to get archers into a phalanx and ultimately resorts to using them for shooting enemies at a distance. Good enough, he says. In a desperate attempt by Eswatini, Lagano flips again. Sadly, there's a trireme and a horseman nearby to recapture it. Maybe if Labotsiveni can get her swordsman near the walls, she would ensure to hold on to it longer, given the lack of melee units on Ndongo's side. Oh well, thinks Philip II of Macedon, as Dominor falls and he dies in the process. No Mamluk units can save the city now. The only thing they can hope for is to defend Cairo and Damietta long enough to not be the second one to go. And that might even be too much for them to do. I expect Saba to make a move at Damietta soon. And on Sierra Leone's side, Kanema finally falls. Their hold on Western Africa is now solid, but they still have to expand a lot if they want to be a big player. However, the roads to Rabat, Marrakesh, and Meknes after that are hard to navigate. Despite their complete removal from the competition, the Alawites still manage to be a roadblock for their neighbor. The Balardong saga continues after a few flips, and now the city will be completely removed from the map. A sad day for all its fans. Meanwhile, a tentative attack on Kriwa begins. New Holland, it cannot possibly be that hard. Why is it taking so long? Why are you so bad at this? By the way, these catapults seem to have been forgotten in the Atlantic Ocean in the process. Remember when I said yellow knives would nullify the Pueblo Tuli War? This is it in action. A single Pueblo trireme has no way of escaping death as Yellowknife ships block the way, silently watching. John Stuart Mill, a philosopher and economist, joins Zhang and writes his treatises on liberalism. 
The Zhang King and the nobility in charge watch with a suspicious eye. Back to Indonesia, Zhang still holds Lamitan, and those disparate mag units can only hope to damage the city in rage, but never to retake it. Simue still holds in the green, but with new Wagi forces incoming, don't know how long that will last. Unsurprisingly, Harappa retakes Mergar, although the city will flip again. The pressure around Dolavira also weakens for the moment, but the Afsharids can still get it back together. Meanwhile, a huge development is happening in South America, as Ecuador seems to think that Tiwanaku is weak enough that they can attack them. And from here, it's hard to disagree with them on that. But what can they realistically hope for? Ojo is a weak city, but the mountains surrounding it will make it a slugfest. Lukurmata and Pajchiri are easier to access, but stronger, and will produce more units. It's almost like the only thing Ecuador can hope for here is to capture some of these juicy, unused workers. However, if either New Holland or Bora Bora join in, things could get ugly real fast. We go back to China for the end of the shang Goguryeo War and a disastrous peace deal. Shang cedes Xinjiang, having failed to recapture Yanxi or push to Yodong. Not all is lost for them, but this is a major setback for the Fox Queen. In case you were wondering, Shang keeps their Arctic city of Zhengzhou. Is it worth it? And it has begun. New Holland declares war on Tiwanaku. Frankly, the front lines do not look as crowded as I would have imagined. I mean, just look at all these Dutch troops in the water. Will these two fronts do anything to handicap Tiwanaku? Will Bora Bora join in on the fight? Meanwhile, Milton S. Hershey, of Hershey's chocolate fame, scours the Amazon for chocolate. Mergar flips again, but as I have been saying, the real battle is in Dolavira. The city has taken damage, and there's a strong number of units laying siege to it. If it falls, some nice, open, flat terrain will lead the Afsharids straight to Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro. Amongst a trio of random wars being declared, one actually involves two neighbors, as the Zungars march against Kazakhstan. Astana and Petropavl are near. I don't believe Dalin can lay siege on the former, but he could make a decent attempt for the latter. In a fit of maniacal laughter, Gushi Khan decides Daji has shown too much weakness and gets ready to invade. On paper, he has more units on the front line than Shang has, However, mountains exist. Nivkh declares an irrelevant war on Kazakhstan, and we get a good view of their core. They still have some strength, but with Golgorio being done with the Shang War, you have to wonder whether they will be the next target. The Ballad of Balardong comes to a sad, bitter end, with the final destruction of the city just as Nungar units might have saved it. In other Australian news, Minge is threatened but untouched, and Kriwa gets to yellow. Kazakhstan's situation worsens as the Selkups declare war. If you remember well, this is what our spy warned us of back in slide 11. Although I don't see an immediate danger for any of their cities, Astana is now potentially attacked from two sides. In the center of the shot, a Mongolian scout wonders how he will escape to a place of peace. So did everyone decide Shang was now fair game? Zhang declares and starts hammering at the walls of Qinglanggang. Daji's army is still strong and will surely be able to defend to the south and maybe turn the tide, but that two sieves with vastly worse stats have chosen to attack her is quite alarming. Roberto Rossellini, the Italian neorealist filmmaker, joins Palawa. 
he decides he will write a play of the Australian Wars, just as the attack on Crewa peters out. Suppose you were the Osage. Who would you attack? Florida or Seneca? Both wars are not that easy, but you need to wage one or you will be cast into irrelevancy. Pahuska apparently considers going after Corn Planter. Let's see if he sticks to it. Ishtar transfers some more Osage intrigue. Pahuska launches a sneak attack against another sieve, which means they consider another sieve weak enough to where they're almost ready to declare war. So who will it be? Osage espionage is too much to handle for our recruit, so we send her to Pueblo. Hopefully she can decipher whether they will try to punish Osage for that first elimination. Taking a look back at the Burgundian War, a major development has happened. Ludwig's armies, now run by the Argentinian President Juan Perón, are nearing Dijon. Those catapults are a bit too far to start a proper siege, but the English forces will provide some help. Everything looks bad for Burgundy, but hey, the Visigoths still found a way to not do anything. Oh, but what is this on the sidebar? Bora Bora joins the anti-Tiwanaku war. The health of these Pacific islands falls to half in one turn, and with the size of that fleet, you could even expect Omo on the continent to be in danger. Sadly, we don't get a good look at Bora Bora's Argentinian cities and how they will affect Tiwanaku's home front. But thinking about it, while New Holland and Moreno will have to grind their way through to those continental cities, probably to no avail, Bora Bora stands to win a bunch of easy targets. They're not the biggest prize, but still. Case in point, Will Kauain, one of Tiwanaku's new colonies near Papuasia, will probably not last long. Sure, this conquest will multiply the risks of war against Wagi and Palawa in the future, but why care? A first Kazakh debacle ensues as Bukhara retakes Herat. I don't think any of these horsemen nearby will be fast enough to flip it this turn, so this might be the time to end that war. Somewhere between slide 21 and this one, Kizilorda was taken by Latvia. Now Kazakhstan took it back, and we will probably not see Latvia taking it again. What's more interesting is Kazan deciding to declare war on their blue neighbor, who now face a five-pronged war. The Urals will block most eastward attacks, but these cities to the north are pretty open. This is a good time for opportunists. The info message also tells me I was wrong, as Nur Sultan is able to take Herat out of Bukhara's hands again. Damn. One of the Kum Tapi, Wagi's pikemen boosted by rough terrain, hangs around on the Karaks in Simoe's Bay, preparing for landing. Lamitan is at zero health, and Mag's melee units could, maybe, attempt a small amphibious attack to flip it, but this would just be pushing it. Oh, Dodgy, what has happened to you? How did the weak and the meek decide that you were weaker than them? Now even Mongolia decides to attack, and Old Sarai is nearly unprotected. Even Xiao Tung will be under fire soon. Sure, Shang still has a good army and a strong core, but there's a strong possibility something will end up falling. I counted around 20 triremes that disappeared or died trying to attack Pelotas just this episode, and finally one manages to do it. In honor for the dead, Moritz sets the island ablaze and wonders if he has the courage to go and finish the job in the Antarctic. Also, we get a look at Bora Bora's mainland army, and it is no trifle for Tiwanaku to deal with. Tangiers flips again, reduced to one health, but more interestingly, Sierra Leone is attempting a pincher attack on Marrakesh from the north and the south. The lack of siege units is concerning, but I won't deny them their chances. 
Here we can see Sihulu Maloyo, another of Swazi's unique GP. But we mostly see Mogadishu's complete failure at taking Zahran. I understand cities are more resistant to triremes now, but Mog has Kerex. Things can change, but this is fumbling at an unprecedented level. Melita Bentz rode her way to Boriken to sell her new invention, the coffee filter. The product is on its way to great success. When you're in the Tainos, you need every help to stay awake. And this episode ends like the last one did, with a shot of the Burgundian War. The Bavarian advance, now led by Baldwin IV of Kingdom of Heaven fame, is not showing progress. The Visigoths are starting to damage Asturica's walls, although it's not sure they will take it, and Amiens seems poised to fall to the British fleet at some point or another. Charles is having a rough time, and next episode might signal the end for him. With this, the episode comes to an end. Thank you for giving me the chance to narrate. It was a blast to do it. See you next episode. And from your humble voice, Doc Ito, if it matters to you, happy 4th of July. If it doesn't matter to you, happy Thursday. I'll see you later.